Good evening, I'm David Kramer with Alaska Weather. As always, please visit our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. You can get any updates to the forecast or check out any watches, warnings, or advisories that we have out for your area. You can also call the weather info line at 1-800-472-0391. Get any updates to the forecast through that means as well. We'll take a quick look at those warnings and advisories that we have out. We'll start in the Thompson Pass area where we do have a blizzard warning in effect through the pass, and that is in effect until noon on Thursday. In that same area through Thompson Pass, we do have a high wind warning that will be in effect from 9 p.m. this evening until 4 p.m. on Thursday. And that one is going to extend down into Valdez as well, the high wind warning. The blizzard warning will stay in Thompson Pass, but the high wind warning will cover both Thompson Pass and the town of Valdez. Up in the Susitna Valley, we have a wind chill advisory that is in effect from the Broad Pass area and areas further to the north, and that is going to be in effect until noon on Thursday. Down in the Skagway area, we have a blizzard warning in effect primarily for the Klondike Highway and up through White Pass, but will impact the uh, town of Skagway as well with some visibilities dropping down near a quarter mile or less. And then we, we have that blizzard in effect from 6 p.m. this evening until 6 p.m. on Thursday. Moving up north, we have wind chills all the way through parts of the west or eastern part of the interior part of the state. Two wind chill warnings up along the Arctic coastline in effect from midnight tonight near Prudhoe Bay and then by Kaktovik through 6 a.m. on Thursday. Wind chill advisory for the southeastern part of the Brooks Range, including Arctic Village, is going to be in effect until 9 p.m. this evening and then down in the eastern part of the Alaska Range, in effect until noon on Thursday. The coldest of these is going to be up by the Dead Horse area where wind chills could drop down as low as minus 65 degrees. Then out along the west coast of the state, we have winter weather advisories, for uh, blowing snow conditions, primarily along the Chukchi Sea coastline and then down through the Bering Strait coastline. And, and then more northern locations, we are going to see that 9 p.m. this evening until noon on Friday. And as we get closer towards the Bering Strait area, 9 p.m. this evening until 6 a.m. on Friday. Taking a look at our satellite imagery, we can see one system coming in from the west that is bringing some cloud cover and then precipitation underneath that with that frontal band approaching the western Aleutian Islands, uh, pushing closer towards the central Aleutian Islands as well. Out over the Bering Sea and the central Aleutians and eastern Aleutians, you can see some of the lower cloud decks underneath high pressure that is dominating the area there, holding up this frontal system to some degree until that uh, ridging starts to push off to the east. Out over mainland Alaska, we have some or a lack of cloud cover there, just some colder temps with higher pressure out over mainland part of the state, helping to reinforce the cold weather that we are seeing. And then down in the Gulf of Alaska, we have one weaker low in the northern part of the Gulf, and then another system coming up from the south, bringing a lot of warm air and moisture to the Panhandle area. The result of that is snow in the northern locations of the Panhandle and mixing more and more towards rain as we get further to the south and at lower elevations. Near the water in the central and southern parts of the Panhandle, we are expecting to see more rain, but at higher elevations and further to the north, expecting that to be snow. Or we're seeing some higher snow amounts arriving for areas in the northern locations and out by Yakutat. As we move off into south central Alaska, blowing snow conditions for the Thompson Pass area, and then we still have other areas of snow in the Copper River Basin, down into the Prince William Sound area and areas further to the east. High pressure dominating much of mainland Alaska, some lighter showers up in the northeastern part of the state, and then just off the coastline to the northwest. Down through the Chukchi Sea coast and Bering Strait coast, we are going to see those blowing snow conditions. And then down the rest of the west coast, not a lot of precipitation until we get into the Killbucks, where we're going to see some lighter snow showers there. And then on the northern side, or the Bering side of the Alaska Peninsula and to the eastern Aleutian Islands, that flow is going to bring some showers on that Bering side. Then as we look out to the west, we have our low pressure system moving in, pushing up some snow into the western Aleutian Islands, bringing that rain snow line ever closer to the western Aleutians. By tonight, we are going to see that rain making it into the islands and that frontal system overall pushing a little bit further east bringing in some snow and some rain to the central Aleutian Islands. As we look out further to the east, our ridging is starting to push off more and more to the east, just leaving some isolated areas of snow along the Alaska Peninsula. 
High pressure dominating much of mainland Alaska, which is some lighter areas of snow up along the northwestern part of the state, but the remainder of the mainland pretty dry until we get down by the Yakutat area where our low pressure out over the eastern part of the Gulf, bringing in a lot of snow to northern locations, but still enough warm air to bring a mix of rain and snow to the southern locations of the Panhandle. Then on Thursday, more warm air being reinforced into the Panhandle area. Those southern locations starting to see more rain, starting to diminish the amounts of snow as we get further to the north as this system continues to weaken and eventually pushes off to the south. High pressure out over mainland Alaska, keeping south central and the interior pretty dry. But up along the Arctic coastline up by Ukiagvik, we are going to see some lighter snow showers up there with some areas of blowing snow along the northwestern part of the state. Down in the St. Lawrence Island area, we are expecting to see some snow there down into the northern parts of the Yukon Delta as well. And then our system is pushing, our western system is pushing further into the Bering Sea, bringing that rain snow line further to the north and further to the east with some of the rain making it to the eastern Aleutian Islands. However, the Purple Ops will stay cold enough to be snow on Thursday. Then out by the western Aleutian Islands, that northerly flow bringing in some of that cold air back wrapped around into the system, bringing in snow to the western Aleutian Islands. Finally on Friday, that low is starting to diminish and move into the eastern part of the Bering Sea, but still bringing snow to the Pribilof Islands and along the west coast of the state. However, a new system coming in from the west bringing more snow to the western Aleutian Islands and some another warm push with that, starting to bring that rain closer towards the central Aleutians. Stepping out further to the east, we have a low pressure system to the, on the Pacific side of the Alaska Peninsula, bringing some snow to the Bristol Bay area, some areas around the Barren Islands as well. But not a lot of precipitation in the interior part of the state or south central, just some off the coastline of the North Gulf Coast. And then down in the Panhandle, finally clearing up a little bit, just some lingering light showers over the central part of the uh, Panhandle as the low pressure that was by the, uh, or the area was moving further to the south. Looking at our lows that we expect for starting off in the Panhandle area, dropping down to right around freezing for southern locations, much colder further to the north, down to 11 degrees by Skagway. Out into south central Alaska, primarily getting below zero, but places along the North Gulf Coast, such as Cordova, going to stay above zero. 10 degrees expected for Cordova, 14 for Kodiak. In the interior part of the state, getting pretty cold around minus 40 to some areas a little bit warmer in the minus 30s. As we get further off to the west, warmer conditions as well. Galena minus 28. And up along the Arctic coastline, minus 30s for the most part, especially in the eastern locations. Warmer along the west coast, negative single digits for the most part. And that's going to extend all the way down to the Bristol Bay area. But as we get into the Aleutians, warmer conditions are expected, dropping down to around freezing for most of the islands. Pribilof's a little bit colder, down to 24 degrees. High temperatures for Thursday getting up into the or right around 40 degrees for the Aleutian Islands. Above zero all along the west coast of the state. Kotzebue staying a little bit colder, only getting up to minus three, otherwise getting above zero. Then along the Arctic coastline staying below zero. But as we drop down into the Brooks Range, only get up into the minus teens and into the minus single digits for the central and eastern parts of the interior. Down in south central Alaska, getting into the positive teens. Uh, at Glen Allen, going to stay a little bit colder, only getting up to positive 3. And then we have Cordova getting up to positive 20. Down in the Panhandle, getting up above freezing in the very southern locations, but staying into the teens for the more northern locations. Yakutat at 26 degrees. Friday morning, dropping down into the 20s for southern parts of the Panhandle. Single digits up by Skagway, 5 degrees expected there. In south central, similarly to Thursday morning, uh, staying below zero for interior locations, but staying above zero along the North Gulf Coast. 18 degrees expected for Kodiak. Into the interior part of the state, in the minus 30s for the central portions, colder as we get further to the east, Arctic, or Fort Yukon getting the coldest there, minus 41 degrees on Friday morning. Along the Arctic coastline, minus 20s in the east, minus teens in the west, and then getting to the minus single digits right along the coastline, dropping down. No minus one, Shishmaref at minus four. A little bit warmer there out by Gamble, 13 degrees expected low Friday morning. And then negative single digits into the Bristol Bay area, into the 30s along the Alaska Peninsula, but staying above freezing for those morning lows for, throughout the Aleutian Islands and 29 for St. Paul. Friday afternoon highs, getting into the low 40s are right about 40 for the Aleutian Islands. And then as we get into the mainland part of the state, warmer throughout much of mainland Alaska, 
compared to Thursday afternoon for Friday afternoon into the teens for Bristol Bay area, single digits to lower teens for much of the YK Delta area, and that extends into the Seward Peninsula area as well. Single digits along the northwest coast, but staying below zero as we get to the eastern portions of the Arctic coastline. Staying below zero for much of the northern part of the interior, single digits in the southern parts of the interior, then in the teens for south central Alaska, and then in the 20s and 30s for the Panhandle. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. I'm meteorologist Amanda Bowen with a look at your flying weather. For Thursday morning, we see a lot of IFR for the western Aleutians associated with a front that's going to be moving through. Also, IFR along the west coast from about the Yukon Delta up through Norton Sound. Some IFR as well along the north slope near Utkiagvik. And in the northern gulf and the immediate coastal portions of the Alaska Panhandle. For Thursday afternoon, that IFR with the front and the Aleutians continues to spread east with some improvement to marginal conditions for the western Aleutians. Still IFR along the north slope, in fact, that's going to be spreading east as well towards the Canadian border. Some improvement, though, for the Panhandle with IFR just in the higher terrain of the southern portions of the Panhandle for Thursday afternoon. For Friday morning, as that front in the Aleutians continues to move east, we'll see that IFR also continue to move east into the Alaska Peninsula. For the North Slope areas, a lot of IFR conditions right along the coast. And then for the Panhandle, improving some to marginal conditions with even some BFR for the Northern Panhandle. Friday afternoon, improvement for many locations. So we see marginal conditions across most of the Aleutians, some IFR for the south side of the Alaska Peninsula and up into Bristol Bay, as well as around St. Lawrence Island. For the Panhandle, mostly marginal conditions with VFR for the rest of the Alaska mainland. Taking a look at your pass forecast for Thursday, Annex Tuvik MVFR in the morning on the north side of the pass, improving to VFR in the afternoon. Same thing at Adigan and at Maryland Lake Clark VFR. Rainy and windy passes both VFR on Thursday. Isabel MVFR in the morning, improving to VFR in the afternoon. And that morning MVFR is going to be on the north side of the pass. Pretty much the same thing at Mentasta, MVFR on the north side in the morning, improving to VFR in the afternoon. VFR at Tanita as well as Portage. And then looking at Chilkoot and White, MVFR in the morning, improving to VFR in the afternoon. Taking a look at freezing levels for Thursday morning, surface freezing levels ranging from the central Aleutians through the Gulf and all the way to the higher terrain of the Panhandle with warmer air moving into the western Aleutians, so two to 4,000 foot freezing levels there. For icing on Thursday, quite a lot of isolated moderate, mostly for the Bering Sea and Aleutians above about 7,000 feet. And then for most of the panhandle between about 5,000 and 8,000 feet. Looking at the jet stream, we have our two low pressure systems, one over the Gulf and one over the Bering Sea, about 130 knots out of the north on the west side of that low over the western Aleutians, 100 knots out of the south for the central Aleutians, about 90 knots out of the west for the west coast of the mainland, and then 100 to about 130 knots out of the southwest coming into the British Columbia coast. 9,000 foot winds on Thursday, still our same two low pressure systems in play. We both, we have some strong winds around both of them. So we got 50 knots out of the west or northwest for the western Aleutians, decreasing to about 20 knots out of the south for the central Aleutians and about 30 knots out of the south for much of the Alaska Peninsula. 15 knots out of the southwest to west for the YK Delta. Not much in the way of wind for the interior, just 5 to 10 knots, about 20 knots out of the west and northwest for the north slope, and then about 15 knots out of the northwest coming into the Kenai Peninsula and Prince William Sound area. Around that low for the panhandle, we see about 30 knots all the way around that low. 3,000 foot winds dealing with the same low pressure systems, so we'll see some 50 knot winds out of the south on the east side of that low in the Aleutians, that's gonna be in the Bering Sea, about 40 knots out of the west for the western Aleutians. Increasing a little bit for the eastern Aleutians, for the central Aleutians, to about 50 knots out of the south, about 30 knots out of the south for the Alaska Peninsula. Again, not a lot in the way of wind over the interior, just five to about 15 knots, as high as 25 knots off the north slope. 
and we'll be looking at some strong winds coming out of the Alaska Range at about 40 knots over the Kenai Peninsula. Also about 40 knots on the west side of a low over the Panhandle and about 50 knots right over the terrain of the Panhandle on Thursday. For turbulence, we talked about those strong winds over the Kenai Peninsula at about 3,000 feet. That's going to be giving us some chances for breaking mountain waves. So isolated severe over Prince William Sound in particular for Thursday. Also some isolated severe with cold front moving through the Aleutians. Stay tuned for more Alaska TV weather. Welcome to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And joining us once again is our good friend Eric Stevens from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska. Uh, he is here and has been here many times to talk to us about weather satellites and how those can help Alaskans understand our weather, how we can do better detection, keep more people safe from things even like volcanic ash. But today, Eric, you're going to talk to us a little bit more about weather satellites and how that can keep Alaskans safe and protect our property from wildfire, right? That's right, Dave. Uh, today's topic is uh, where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh -huh. And uh, thanks for having us back again to Alaska Anytime. Weather. Well, um, Weather satellites have a lot of different instruments on them. Uh -huh. It turns out that the electromagnetic spectrum has a lot going on in it, and only one part of that is visible light, what we see. Right. Weather satellites, of course, report that. Today's topic is wildfires. Okay. There are some people who say that in Alaska in the summertime, you don't have severe weather. These people are usually from Oklahoma <laughs> or somewhere. And, and F5 tornadoes tend not to occur in Alaska. Right. People have also said what we do have in the summer. What is Alaska's severe summer weather can be hydrology, right. flash flood and, and uh, erosion mm -hmm. in the mountains and things like that, and fires, right. wildfires. Absolutely. Those were here in 2004, certainly remember that. I've got an example here from 2014. Mm -hmm. Now, it was a quiet season overall, but in May, down on the Kenai Peninsula, we had a uh, wildfire on the Funny River, mm -hmm. and this is a satellite image from a satellite, a polar orbiter that went right over Alaska, mm -hmm. and we can see the plume of smoke coming out of that fire on the Kenai, curling down, it's caught in the wind, right. it goes down toward Kodiak Island, curves around, you can see it circulating around a low pressure system that's in the Gulf yeah, of Alaska. It was a beautiful picture. Oh my gosh. Except there was a fire. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fire there. The nice thing is with this satellite image, you can tell where, this, where the fire origin is, where right. the smoke is coming from. And um, it's a color image. We're looking at the wavelength spectrum of about 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers or microns. Mm -hmm. That's what the human eye would see. If you were riding on the satellite and look down, you could see this kind of an image. Right. So that's pretty nice. But it turns out there's more to the electromagnetic spectrum than just visible light. Okay. You've heard of infrared ultraviolet, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. If we move into longer wavelengths, let's go to one specifically, 3.7 microns. Okay, 3.7. Why worry about that one? Okay. Well, we've got an example here. 3.7, it turns out, happens to be very sensitive to a certain temperature range, temperatures where fires burn. Okay. And so we've got an example zoomed in a little more from that same Funny River fire mm -hmm. down on the Kenai Peninsula, and we can see that you get up into a few hundred degrees Fahrenheit, right. and that's where the colors are. We can see there... Um, on the Funny River Fire to the west and to the east, almost a horseshoe shape there, mm -hmm. is not only we're seeing where the fire is in a general sense, but specifically where it's the active so fire that is where front. it's burning right now. Mm -hmm. And it's 3.7 okay. microns is the important temperature there. Okay. That's right. So it, this is really important to firefighters on the ground, people that are making plans and directing the firefighters on where they need to go and cut the trenches and keep people safe. You know it. Wow. If you want to fight that fire, you got to know where it is. Okay. You got to know the leading edge. We've also got a movie loop, nothing mm -hmm. quite like animating it in time. Yeah. You can see the fire spreading out over time with a succession of films cool. or a succession of uh, images. Mm -hmm. Now this is one channel, 3.7 micron. You know, we looked at that color smoke image before. Right. And that's actually a red, a green, and a blue. That's how you get color imagery. Uh -huh. What if you took three different wavelengths in the infrared? You went from like 2.2 um, micron, 1.5 micron, up to 3.7. You mix them together, you get this other kind of color image, which is even a better way to oh, wow. sharply bring out the details of where that leading edge of the fire is. Okay. You'll note, though, in the infrared, guess what? We don't see the smoke. Uh, that's too bad. Okay. And on these movie loops, you can see the clouds go by. These channels can't see through clouds. The lesson is there's no one perfect solution. You've got to okay. have the visible, you've got to have some of that infrared single 3.7 channel, some of the infrared mixing mm -hmm. to help get a different perspective. 
another one. We've talked before about a, a fun channel called the Day Night Band. Yes, one of my favorites. Oh yeah, and in Alaska in the winter, it's great. We've got all this darkness. The Day Night Band is so sensitive to seeing light. Uh -huh. um, you can see features that otherwise aren't available. Now in Alaska, when you have a forest fire, it tends to be light out all the time. Right. It's our summer. But we can go down south to the Rim Fire in California in okay. 2013. Now, okay, it was in California, not Alaska, but Alaskan crews went down to fight that fire, so we Fair can enough. talk about it here in Alaska weather. Here we have a, a 3.7 micron channel shot of the, of the rim fire, again, kind of a horseshoe shape, showing right. that active fire front down there. And then we'll look again to the day-night band, the visible light, and then you can see how the fire is all bright. You can see the active fire front and actually the, the city lights over there, too. Turns yes. out that the cities, while they're active in a social sense, are not really hot in a fire sense. So um, they don't show up in the 3.7 micron. They're not hot like a fire is, but the fire in the cities look the same from a visible light perspective. And a fun thing here, too, is that we can see the smoke plume going north from the rim fire wow. on the... Uh, on the day-night band. So yeah. if we were ever to have, like in 2004 in Alaska, you get mm -hmm. dark at night, we still had an active fire season that year. Right, that was, right. a, you know, that really bad year. The day-night band didn't exist then, but it, if we had fires now in August, we could use it then. The lesson here is weather satellites, they offer many different wavelengths of light. Uh -huh. Some are used for different purposes, and some of these we just looked at tonight are especially helpful here in Alaska to find and to track the behavior of these wildfires so the crews can go out there and do their jobs. Sure, sure. So a satellite toolbox for the, the firefighting crews and the fire weather forecasters, and it just underlines how important satellites are, uh, especially for Alaska and our, our mission for the National Weather Service to uh, protect life and property and uh, also to enhance the national economy. So wonderful mm -hmm. stuff there, Eric. And people can look at pictures uh, like this anytime by going to gina.alaska.edu. Uh, you'll find images there all around Alaska at various times of the year and not just about fire weather, but uh, volcanic ash and smoke and uh, anything else you want to check out. They're always beautiful pictures and always interesting to look at no matter what time of the day. Thanks again for joining us, Eric. We appreciate it and welcome you back anytime uh, for this edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. See you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Taking a look at today's sea ice edge, we see the edge of that less than 80% concentration has reached the south side of St. Paul, but not for long. We're seeing some ice moving south at the moment, but with low pressure systems moving through the south bearing, we'll see that ice recede again just a little bit uh, a couple of times in the next few days with low pressure systems moving through. So in general, no further expansion south. That ice is going to be kind of moving around its current location within about 20 to 30 nautical miles with low pressure systems moving through for the rest of the week. Taking a look at southeast winds and seas, quite windy for the panhandle with low pressure just offshore and moving through over the next day or two. So we have 35 to 50 knot winds over the inside waters with gusts to 60 to 65 knots farthest in inside, as well as 25 to 50 knot winds over the Gulf. That's all going to be out of the north and northeast. Seas ranging from about 10 feet in the North Gulf to about 17 feet in the Southern Gulf, about 9 to 15 feet for the inside waters. For Friday, winds coming down quite a lot uh, behind that low pressure system, so 15 to 25 knots for the inside waterways out of the North and East, and then anywhere from 10 knots in the Northern Gulf to 15 to 25 knots right along the Panhandle coast. That's going to be out of the east. Seas also coming down in the six to nine foot range, around four to five feet for the inside waters. Thursday's marine forecast for south central, again, very windy in spots. We're looking at more gap winds for south central. So where we see that gap right outside of Cordova, as well as through the gap between Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island will see 35 to 50 knot winds with gusts to 70 knots possible with that gap in the North Gulf. Now, those are gonna be very localized winds. So if you're on one side of the gap, you'll see 
only about 20 knot winds and about 20 to 30 knots on the other side with those very high gusts right in that gap area. So beware of exactly where you are if you're planning to go out. For Friday, we see those winds come down quite a bit in the 10 to 20 knot range out of the northeast and east for the entire area. Seas also coming down to five to six feet, two feet in Prince William Sound. Thursday for the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, again, very windy, especially with those gaps on the east side of Kodiak Island, around 50 knots with 24 foot seas, 20 to 40 knots for the peninsula and then 10 knots in the Bristol Bay area. Seas anywhere from seven feet on the south side of the peninsula to around 13 feet a little bit further north towards Kodiak Island and then again that 24 feet just east of Kodiak Island for Thursday. For Friday, everything coming down just as we've seen in the other areas. So winds coming down to 10 to 25 knots, seas coming down to five to 12 feet for Friday. For the Aleutians, this is where our low pressure is. We can see in the winds that they're just, that low is just north of the Western Aleutians. So we'll be seeing winds on Thursday, 35 to 40 knots across the board, seas anywhere from about 12 to 20 feet. And then Friday, as that low passes, we'll see everything come down to some extent. Seas coming down significantly to eight to 11 feet on the north side of the chain and 14 to 17 feet on the south side, and then winds out of the west, 25 to around 30 knots. For the west coast, winds generally out of the southeast, 15 to 25 knots today, about 10 feet of seas on the ice edge. And then for Friday, 15 to 30 knots, not a whole lot of change, still out of the east generally, seas pretty consistent around nine feet near the ice edge. For the north slope, 10 to 20 knots along the north slope and then 30 to 35 knots um, al along the west coast that's going to be out of the south and then for friday those coming down as well about 15 knots out of the south for the north slope 15 to 20 knots on the west coast we have our low pressure system that's going to be moving into the aleutians as well as another low moving into the panhandle bringing those winds thanks so much for watching alaska tv weather these forecasts are for planning purposes only Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.